From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Errol Flynn and Joan Blondell in The Perfect Specimen with Mae Robeson. Lux presents Hollywood. This is a play which tells how romance comes to a young man who never does anything the wrong way. Starred, as they were on the screen, are Errol Flynn, Joan Blondell, and Mae Robeson. And our special guest is Dr. Floyd L. Rue, distinguished psychologist of the University of Southern California. Conducting our music is Lewis Silvers. Now, before turning the microphone over to Mr. DeMille, may I say a word about the famous white soap that brings you this program. When the lovely Hollywood stars talk about feminine charm, lovely women everywhere listen. And that's why Lux Toilet Soap, the screen star's gentle complexion care, is being used more and more as a bath soap, too. Such beautiful stars as Loretta Young say, with fragrant Lux soap, it's easy to be sure of daintiness. Its active lather leaves skin fresh and sweet. I always use it. You'll be delighted with the rich, fragrant lather of Lux toilet soap, with the delicate perfume it leaves on your skin. Make it your daily beauty bath. And here's your host and the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Holiday greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The start of a new year is always a time of adventure. And tonight we bring you an adventurer in the person of Errol Flynn. A constable in the New Guinea police at 17, then overseer of a copra plantation, then columnist for a Sydney, Australia newspaper, master of a trading boat, gold prospector, member of the Australian boxing team in the 1928 Olympics, he's never stopped roving. He hopes to do his next roving on his yacht, the Sirocco Second, in the annual race from California to Hawaii. At present, he's starring in Dawn Patrol, Warner Brothers' current success. Tonight, Errol reenacts the same part he played in a previous film hit. He becomes Gerald Wicks in The Perfect Specimen. Joan Blondell is the lovely lady who stars opposite him tonight, just as she did in the picture. Born in New York, Joan spent her first seven birthdays in seven different countries traveling with her father, a noted vaudeville comedian. Her first 22 birthdays were spent in 22 different cities. But Joan didn't troop directly into screen stardom. She ran a dress shop in Texas and worked in a New York bookstore before coming to Hollywood and such sprightly Warner films as her new one, called Off the Record. She's heard tonight as Mona Carter. And that grand veteran of the footlights, Miss May Robeson, begins her 56th year of acting by joining our cast as Mrs. Leona Wicks. And so the Lux Radio Theater opens its 1939 season, presenting Errol Flynn and Joan Blondell in The Perfect Specimen. Morning at Wickstead, the imposing estate of the fabulous Mrs. Leona Wicks and our still more fabulous grandson, Gerald. Approaching this Pennsylvania mansion, we see two guards patrolling inside the fence with savage-looking Great Danes on leashes. Before the door of the house is a sign that reads, Don't enter without ringing. Beside it, another that says, Don't ring. Disregarding all this, we peer into the Wickstead dining room. Grandma Leona Wicks enters briskly and is greeted by a retinue of servants. A chiming clock is heard as Grandma consults the old-fashioned watch dangling from a chain around her neck. Hmm. That clock's wrong again. Fifteen seconds slow. Well, don't stand around like a lot of ninnies. Serve the breakfast. Where's everybody? Where's Mr. Grattan? Here I am, Mrs. Wicks. Of course you are. I can see you, can't I? That clock in the hall's fifteen seconds slow. Call the clockmaker. But I really don't... Then get another clock. Yes, Mrs. Wicks. And another thing. I heard a rooster start to crow this morning. Uh, Find out who is responsible and dismiss him. Yes. Gerald's sleep must not be disturbed, nor Alicia. Yes, Mrs. Weeks. Well, well, where is everyone this morning? Good morning, Aunt Leona. Good morning. It's practically afternoon. Alicia? I don't like your hair that way. Did you sleep well? Not like a log. Nonsense. Logs have bumps. Young ladies don't. Where's Gerald? Evidently overslept 30 seconds. Now, don't you be impudent. Yes, ma'am. Alfred? 
What's my grandson's schedule for today? Oh, outdoor study, 10 o'clock. Business administration, 11. Luncheon, 12.30. Scientific relaxation till 2. Gymnasium till 3. Industrial law and interstate commerce till 4. Go on, go on. Relaxation in the open and the reading of some improving work till dinner. After dinner... After dinner, he gets locked in his cell. What a life. Don't mumble, Alicia. What were you saying? Aunt Leona, you trust me with Gerald, don't you? I decided he should marry you, didn't I? Well, that... Then why couldn't we go out and have some fun once in a while? There's a dance tonight. Now, don't be absurd. You can dance here. Gerald dances perfectly, his instructors tell me. That's a trouble, Aunt Leona. You have him doing everything perfectly. Perhaps too perfectly. Well, what's wrong with that? You should be proud to know that your husband-to-be will soon take his place at the head of the Wicks Utilities. And he'll be the mental, moral, and physical superior of every one of his 10,000 employees. The perfect specimen. Uh, Good morning, Grandma. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Gerald, you're late. Yes, I'm sorry, Grandma. Just a few minutes. A few minutes? (laughs) Ha! Empires have been lost, fortunes swept away. Because someone was just a few minutes too late. Yes, but Grandma... Gerald, I don't like conversation at the breakfast table. Oh. Alfred. Yes, Mrs. Wicks. I don't like Gerald's attitude this morning. It's positively revolutionary. Now, after breakfast, if you would be good enough to accompany Gerald outdoors and see that he really studies. That's a funny thing, Grant, and I don't understand Grandma saying that. She knows perfectly well I always keep up with my schedule. Yes, so I see. Impressive-looking book, that. What is it, Mr. Gerald? This? Oh, it's the effect of gravity upon inanimate objects. Very interesting. Oh, a little beyond me, but then I was never a conditioned baby like you were. What? Hello. What's that? Sounds like a tractor. Oh, yes, that's what it is. There's some work to be done down by the fence. A new man was hired yesterday, a young man named uh, Jink, I believe. A new man? Well, I don't understand that at all. Of course, I know there must be employment for everybody, but Grandma knows perfectly well I know how to run a tractor. Six years of motor mechanics, and she won't even let me put into practice. Someone had to pick the cotton. Someone had to plant the coal. Oh, da 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 That's why darkies were born. Mm-hmm. Hey, Jim! Mona! What are you doing in there, brother mine? I happen to be working here, sister mine. I'm running a tractor. Now stay on your side of the fence. All right. Now listen, my darling brother. I've been looking all over the place for you. I've got a real job for you, Jink. That bridge span at Providence. They want an engineer, Harvard man with experience and possibly not too bright. So you'd fit perfectly, darling. Don't give me that. You don't care where I work. How did you know I was here, Mona? Well, I figured when a man gives up a job, a supervising engineer, to be a jockey on a plow, there's a reason. You know, you shouldn't leave romantic summer resort letters lying around. And can that Alicia gal steam up a wicked fountain pen? Oh, who is she, Jink? She live here? I ought to sock you one, sis. Now beat it before you get me fired for talking to strangers. Mm-hmm, not till you tell me. I don't intend to. You think I want old Wickstead down on my neck? Wickstead? You mean the Wickstead? Where the heir to the Wicks millions is being scientifically developed into the first Superman? The perfect specimen? This is the place. Oh, do you suppose I could see him? Oh, Jink, please take me inside and introduce me to him. You can do it. Nobody can see him. Nobody? Nobody. Want to bet? Uh, now listen, Mona, for Pete's sakes. Hey, hey, where are you going? I don't know. Maybe have tea with the perfect specimen. Hey, young lady. What do you mean driving through our fence? Oh, hello. Are you hurt? Uh, I don't know yet. Who are you? My name is Wicks. Gerald Beresford Wicks. I live here. Oh, I see. My name's Mona Carter. Do you mind if I get out and look at the damage? No, not at all. Huh. You're certainly very calm. Most girls would be in hysterics by now, crashing through a fence. You must have plenty of nerve. Nerve? You have no idea. Oh, well, don't worry. I'm onto your game. Game? Yes. They all try it. Who all try what? Women. To be fascinating. But I was too smart for you. I saw through you almost at once. Are you a reporter? No, I am not a reporter. Well, they sometimes are. Reporters and photographers. They pop out of bushes at you around here. Are you sure you're... I told you I'm not a reporter. Oh, well then, who are you? Oh, I'm sort of a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. When I do things like crashing through a fence, it's the chilly specknagel in me coming out. 
The witch? Tilly Specknagel. You see, when I was a kid and did anything lo- uh, like, uh, oh, you know, stealing jam or breaking a window, I always said it was a little girl named Tilly Specknagel that did it. Yeah. I'm usually a very well-behaved young lady named Mona Carter, but Tilly's always there, lurking. Hmm. Lurking? Yeah, and ready to smash through. <laughs> You've certainly smashed through. Not much damage to the car, though. How do you know? Well, I've just been looking at it. I'm a master mechanic. Oh, yes, yes, you would be. The perfect specimen must be all things. Of course. Of course. You know, uh, I've always wanted to meet you, Mr. Wicks. Oh, you are a reporter. I am not. Don't you dare call me a reporter again. Well, there's only one other thing you could be. You're a designing female. I am not, you idiot. (sighs) I wouldn't marry you if... Well, in the first place, you're stiff and you're dull and... Worst of all, you're conceited. Conceited? No, no, I don't think I'm conceited. Hey, tell me something. Have you ever been tight? Tight? Huh, of course not. Grandma wouldn't stand ever for it. Ever seen a burlesque show? Why, certainly not. Why, Grandma... Ever kissed a girl? Now, listen. Don't you start anything. I can't afford to be compromised. You can't afford to? Well, and you think you're not conceited. Oh. Say, listen. Why don't you mix with the common herd? Are you really so fragile you have to stay cooped up in here? Hey, Did you ever think of running away? Running away? Where to? Nothing ever happens here or anywhere else. It isn't dull or boring. There's almost nothing. Um, would you uh, care to stay a little longer? Oh, you're unbending. Well, I'll stay for a minute. I feel as though there's something Tilly wants to tell you. (laughs) What's Tilly want to tell me? Windmills. Do you know what you need, my friend? You need to tilt a windmill or two. Windmill or two? Yeah, didn't you ever read Don Quixote? Well, naturally, I've read everything that's improving to the mind, but... uh, Oh... Oh, yes, uh, Don Quixote, the man that fought the windmill. Marvelous. <laughs> well, thanks for everything. And if Grandma ever releases you on parole... She won't. Or if you decide to hop over the walls, remember you've got a friend. You? Nope. Tilly Specknagel. Tilly wants me to tell you that she'd love to help an escaped convict. Goodbye. Hey. Girl! Girl! Oh, ha, I'd better stay. Well, don't you dare drive off. All right, Grandma. Take a number, Gerald. What's all this? It's an accident, Grandma. Whose accident? Well, this uh, girl's. Here. What girl? Why did she do it? Why wasn't she killed? Anyone as stupid as that? Who is this young female? Mona Carter's my name, and you, I suppose, are Grandma. You're not supposed to suppose anything. What are you doing here? I know. She's got designs. No, she hasn't any designs, Grandma. It was an accident. She's good-looking, isn't she? Well... And so you're Grandma, Gerald. Well, I... Uh, yes, I suppose so. She well, is. Well, there you are, then. She's got designs. Mr. Grattan, take a number. I took it, Mrs. Wheat. Take it again and look at the license. Now, this is all very unpleasant, miss. I'll have to see your driver's license, please. But, officer, I didn't know the light was red. You see, I'm colorblind. Your license, please. Here you are. Now, girl, what have you got to say for yourself? Why, I didn't know it was allowed. What was allowed? For anyone to talk but you. Oh! But since I have the chance, there's one thing I do want to say to all of you, and that is goodbye. It was nice running into you. Oh, look, wait. Uh, Don't go through that fence again. Stop. Dear. All I do is start and stop this car. Well, what is it? Well, I, I, I don't know. I do, Gerald. Remember what I said about windmills? What are you two whispering about? Gerald, do you remember? Yes. You mean uh, Don Quixote? Windmills? Yeah. Two to me. Well, start with Grandma. You'll never meet a bigger one. Goodbye. And remember about Tilly Specknagel. Yes. Goodbye. And I left by the young hussy. Yes. Uh, Grandma. Well, what is it, Joe? Are we a well... copy of Don Quixote in the house? Huh? Darling Alicia. Oh, Jink. Oh, stop, you can't do that. You can't kiss me. Well, I did. And I'm going to again. Oh, Jink, please. You mustn't. Oh, why not? Because, because I like it so much. It isn't fair to Gerald bad enough I sneaked away for a moonlight ride with you. Oh, I've got to go in now. Now, listen. If you don't tell that puffed-up ego he's not engaged to you anymore, I'm going to walk in there and kick the... It little... isn't Gerald I'm worried about. It's Grandma, Grandma Wicks. Wicks. Oh, why don't you try to understand? She's been set on my marrying Gerald since I was 16. She's my guardian. I have nothing of my own. If she cuts me off, oh, I have to marry Gerald. Alicia, are you in love with that Gerald squirt? Oh, he's not a squirt. Are you... A... Who comes around the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush. Who? It looks like young Master Wicks himself. Gerald, at this hour? Oh, Jink, better let me go. Bye, darling. 
Hey. What? Hey, you. Oh, oh yes, you're the tractor man. Yeah, it's kind of dark. How'd you know? Well, you're sitting on your tractor. Brilliant. Is that your car over there? Down to the last rattle. What about it? Oh, nothing except I was going to steal it. Until I saw you. Now I think I'll just borrow it. I want to pay a visit. If you'll stay away for a year, you can have it. Oh, I'll only be gone for tonight. Will you rent it then? How much? $25. Okay, it's a deal. Right, here. And uh, I say, my man, don't mention this song. Oh, very well, my good fellow. If you never come back, it'll be too soon. What? I said give her plenty of oil and she'll take you to the top of the world. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thanks. That's where I'm going, the top of the world. Whoa! -ho! Now, Mrs. Wiggs, please don't get excited. Don't get overwrought. In other words, compose yourself. Oh, shut up, you idiot. Where's Gerald? Gerald? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. I was coming to that. He's nowhere to be found. Well, he's got to be found. Don't tell me he can drop from sight in broad daylight. But they've been over the estate with a curry coat. Perhaps he's run away. Oh, stuff and nonsense. What did he want to do that for? Didn't he have everything in the world? And it... He's been kidnapped. That's what. Well, don't stand about like a brace of nincompoops. Move. Telephone the, 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 the G-men or whatever their ridiculous names are. Uh, call the police. Oh, yes, Mrs. Wicks. Aunt Leona, do you think the girl who broke through the fence yesterday could have anything to do with it? Hello. Hello, get me the police. Oh, fiddle-faddle. What earth did we... Uh, Alicia, you might be right. Whatever gave you that idea? Well, I... Here's uh, the phone, Mrs. Wick. Well, give it to me. Hello. Police. My grandson's been kidnapped. What? Why, I'm Mrs. Leona Wicks. Who did you think I was? No, I haven't any photographs. What does he look like? Well, male, six foot one, and... Now, look here. Don't give me any of your impertinence. You'll find my grandson. In just a few minutes, Mr. DeMille and our stars will return for Act Two of The Perfect Specimen. Meantime, in our brief intermission... Let's eavesdrop for a few minutes on someone who's a good friend of all of us, our corner grocer. Morning, Joe. Oh, I'm okay. I was a little tuckered out Saturday night. You see, some people don't decide what to have for Sunday dinner till awful late. Oh, uh, uh, answer that, will you, Joe? Oh, uh, Mrs. Van Buren? I'll take it. You, uh, say somebody must have been walking on eggs over here. I don't understand. Broken? Oh, I'm mighty sorry. I'll uh, send over another dozen right away. Oh, Bill. Bill, take these. And remember, Mrs. Van Buren prefers to scramble them herself. Oh, uh, Mrs. Brown's chauffeur left her order this morning. Help me get it together, will you, Joe? And let's see. A dozen oranges. Three pounds of print butter. A dozen Lux soap. You know, Joe, that lady could spend any amount on expensive soaps, but she always gets Lux. Says it's fine for her skin. <laughs> Some swell-looking lady, too. You know, I was uh, I was telling the wife about her, and she kind of sniffed and said, Well, what's wrong with my looks? Me and the movie stars been using Lux soap for years. And confidentially, Joe, you, you've got to admit that she's there when it comes to looks. Now, don't you? <laughs> oh, quick, Joe. Here comes Mrs. Norton. You know how she hates to wait. Yes, your grocer or druggist will tell you he sells dozens of cakes of Lux toilet soap to women who buy the best. For no finer toilet soap can be made than this gentle, white, delicately perfumed soap. And yet, it is very inexpensive. Lux soap cares for more famous complexions than any other soap in the world. Nine out of ten Hollywood stars use it. And it cares for the complexions of just plain folks, too. Fine-looking women and girls the country over. Its active lather removes dust, dirt, stale cosmetics thoroughly. Screen stars tell you it's foolish to risk cosmetic skin, dullness, tiny blemishes, and large pores. Use Lux Toilet Soap regularly. We do. Here's our producer, Mr. DeMille. We continue with the perfect specimen. Starring Errol Flynn and Joan Blondell with May Robeson.
sunset that same day, the outskirts of the town of Barrisfield. Gerald drives up to a small garage and honks his horn. Getting no reply, he honks it again. Cicero Hooker, the proprietor, comes out and looks at Gerald with definite annoyance. Hey, there, young fella. Uh, hi, Deep. Uh, shall I fill her up? No, thanks. I'm looking for the Carter residence. Well, you can take your choice. There's a whole flock of them around here. Well, the Carter I'm looking for has a daughter. Well, they all got daughters. Oh, well, this one's rather nice looking. Well, why didn't you say so? That there is Professor Carter's gal. <laughs> say, if you think she's only kind of nice looking, <laughs> you'd better get you some cheaters. Yes, yes, but where'd she live? Well, you go straight down the street here, and you turn to your right at the first road outside of town. And then you sort of dog leg past the red schoolhouse and... It's a white house there with a picket fence around it. Oh, picket fence. Eh? Well, thanks very much. Oh! Look out! Uh, hello. Oh, it's you. Yes. Uh, does a girl by the name of Tilly Spreknagel oh. live here by any chance? Right through our fence. I didn't think you had that much nerve. No? Well, I saw something on the porch that interested me. There's a girl reading on a front porch. <laughs> Might funny. <laughs> funny? <laughs> Say, tell me, how did you bust out of that Bastille? Oh, through that hole you made in our fence. I stole Grattan's address book out of his pocket when he was asleep. Now I'll never remember your name or where you are. He never remembers anything anyway, so... Uh, I beg your pardon, my dear, but, uh, Father, uh... this is Mr. Gerald Beresford Wicks. Gerald, my father, Professor Carter. How do you do, my boy? Oh, how do you do, sir? I want to apologize. Not at all. Not at all. Always glad to have Mona's friends drop in. Oh, I mean, I want to apologize about your family. Uh, you see, uh, Father, Mr. Wicks had an accident. Something, uh, uh, something happened with his steering wheel, and he ran through the fence. Oh, yes, uh, to be sure. Uh, how unfortunate. I must apologize to you, Mr. Mr. Uh, Wicks. Mr. Wicks, for yes. the fence being in the way. Oh. I can see now that it is a distinct menace to public safety. I shall have it removed. <laughs> Don't mind Dad, Gerald. You know, he's terrifically famous, aren't you, Dad? Uh, yes, indeed. He's a horticulturist. The King of Sweden gave a medal for, uh, 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 what was that for, Father? For my study of the cytological detail in the development of the zygota of the coleocate. No, uh, uh, that reminds me. The lily bubs that Professor Mannheim sent me from China came in on the 10 o'clock local. They're at the station now. You, you will pardon my excitement, but these are genuine Tonghuas. Most rare. Tonghuas, not the Tonghua from Yuan Kiang Valley? Why, they'll have to be set out immediately, sir. The perfect specimen sees all those. Uh, what were you saying, my oh, dear? Oh, uh, about the bulbs, Dad. You want me to drive down and get them, don't you? Uh, uh, would you mind? Of course not, darling. Come on, Jerry. Jerry? Oh, me? Yes, of course. Uh, goodbye, young fellow. I'll have that fence removed first thing. Oh, thanks. Well... <laughs> You know, Tilly, I must say your father could give Grandma a lesson in how to act when strangers come crashing through their fences. He could give her lessons in anything. Say, do you know what you called me back there? No, what? Well, you called me uh, Jerry. Would you mind still doing it? You see, I've never been called that before. Oh, yes, I'd be glad to. Hello, Jerry. Oh, hello. Uh, thanks. Would you uh, like some music, Jerry? The station's still a way off, Jerry. Thanks. Gentlemen, we interrupt this program to bring you an unverified report stating that Gerald Beresford Wicks, heir to the Wicks Utilities and the $30 million estate of the nationally famous eccentric Mrs. Leona Wicks, is missing, feared kidnapped. Young Wicks, known the country over as the perfect specimen, disappeared at an early hour. I think another station would be better, don't you? So Grandma Wicks has unleashed the bloodhounds already. What are you going to do? Well, I'm not going to let myself be hauled back there like a runaway schoolboy. I'm, I'm going to stay out as late as I like. Bravo! Yes, that Don Quixote, he was the one. Courage. Even if the world laughed at him, he didn't care. Oh, let him laugh at me, too. I don't care, either. Say, Jerry, it may be just head noises, but I think somebody wants to pass. What? Hey, that truck's on top of it. Jerry, get off the road. 
Jerry, that big ape's almost knocked us into a ditch. Hey, what's the idea, punk? What's your idea, you big chump, trying to run us into that tree? Say, you can't talk to Pinky like that. All right, down, Clarabella, now listen. You keep on it, sister. You wouldn't be the first day my smackdown. Oh, now, look here, my man. You can't speak that way to a lady. My man! Don't you mind, man, me? You stuck up squat for two cents, I'd pop you in a push. Well, you're making a big mistake, Mistake? You know. I can't step on here. Jerry, you can't fight him. Come on, come on. Well, remember, my man, I didn't want to spar with you. Spar? Come on, I'll mop up the ground with you. You know, you ought to keep your chin covered and leave with your left, like this. Jump with your left. Sorry, I had to do that. Grandma, I think you've got something there. Uh, I hope I haven't hurt you seriously. I'll help you up. Pinky, Pinky, are you hurt? What's the little silhouette? I'm moited. Oh. Listen, I, uh, I'm sorry, guy. You know you... Well, you got a punch there. Oh, thank you. My boxing instructor, ex-champion McGraw, used to tell me that. I believe he expressed it a kick like a mule. Yeah, he must have had some terrific mules. Well, my name's Picky Cassidy, and this is me dame Clara Bellamoiti. Oh, how do you do? This is Miss Mona Carter, and my name is Gerald... Gerald! You mean to say I got licked by a guy named Gerald? I'll call you a tricky. Pinky, look at your eye! Look at me eye? Where? Where's me eye? What's the matter with... Oh, how can a guy see his eye? Look, look in my mirror! Whoa! Holy mackerel, get a load of that lamp. Hey, Tricky, Tricky, this is terrible. Now, Pinky, be a man. It'll be all right in a day or so. No, it ain't that. It's just in about an hour I'm going to have another fight. Well, don't forget to lead with your left. Where's the fight? It's the annual picnic at a truck driver's and Teamsters local. They got eats and beer and games and dancing. But the best thing on the whole program is the price fight. Yeah, and Pinky was going to get 150 bucks for fighting the headliner. But he can't with his eye closed up. We was going to take the dough and get married on it. No, we can't. Well, of course, he might not have won, you know. I say, how about my substituting for you? You know, allow me to fight in your place. Whoa, 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 what? Would you do that, Tricky? Say, what a pal. What a pal! Shake, pal. Oh, thanks, sir, pal. Now, if you'll tell me how to get to this picnic, All then right. we... All right, come on, Mona. Remember those windmills. <laughs> Very kind of you, Ross. Thank you. Is that your guy over there? Well, there. Throw in the top, pal. You ain't going back in there with that gorilla. Oh, yes, I am. This Mr. Connolly is a very deceiving character. He might think he beat me. Well, what do you mean, think? Ladies and gentlemen, the rest of this fight will be refereed by Ike Bloomfield. Excuse me. What? Hey, shut up. What's the idea? Can't help it, Pinky. There's been a big kidnapper. Gerald's bearers for weeks. They got a dragnet out all over the United States and Canada. We got orders to watch all roads, stop all cars. They say there's a woman involved. And it's my duty as sheriff of this county to assist the search. Carry on, John. I'm 
sorry, Pinky, but I'm afraid I'll have to knock this nice Mr. Connolly out. Something unexpected's happened. I've got to get out of here immediately. Yeah, that's it, kid. You knock him out, I hope. Oh, hello there, Softy. You're coming up for more, eh? I beg your pardon, Mr. Connolly, but I have to do this. <laughs> Smackers. Gee. I don't know how to take it, Tricky, but you know I... Oh, well, I feel like a tramp taking a whole wad. I'll go on and take it, stupid. You know you're going to anyway. Say, Tricky and Mona, why don't you stick around a while and maybe have a dance or something, huh? You ought to see me and Pinky dance a Scranton bounce. Oh, that's that's very tempting. But confidentially, I don't think I can. No, no, you see, he's uh, he's wanted by the police, and if he doesn't get away, you know what's Yeah, happening. taking it on the lamb, huh? Yes, uh, on the lamb. Well, Pinky, goodbye. It's a pleasure knowing you. So long, Prowsey. Goodbye. And Tricky, if you ever get to sing sing, will you send us a phone? Where to now, Jerry? Well, that depends what's on the radio. There ought to be a flash any minute. Special bulletin. Here it is. A woman is under suspicion in the kidnapping of Gerald Wicks, the perfect specimen. Seen yesterday afternoon just before the kidnapping, her identity is still a mystery. The Department of Justice has released this description of her. Suspect number one, female, white, five feet two inches. 108 pounds, approximately. Eyes blue, teeth good, hair blonde, good-looking. This suspect has an assured, intriguing map. Well, that's enough of that. I knew that Grattan has a terrible memory. Does that really sound like me, Jerry? The assured, intriguing manner part of it. Well, come to think of it, it does. Jerry, you better take me home. They'll catch up with me, you know. I'm wanted by the law for kidnapping, and I'm scared. Scared? What about those windmills? What's that got to do with it? Well, you said if I was ever wanted to fight with a windmill, you'd be out with me. Now, I'm not through fighting windmills, Tilly. We're not going home, either. In fact, we're going to park right here and look at the river. <sighs> Moonlight on the water. It's lovely. Yes, and peaceful. Uh, Mona. What? Mona, uh, you once asked me if I ever kissed a girl. Mm-hmm. Well? Well, uh... Hello there, folks! Oh. that? Hi there. Oh, Lord, a hitchhiker. Look at him. Oh, he's wearing a flowing tie and shorts. He'll catch cold. He'll catch a free ride back to the asylum if he's what I think he is. Uh, blessings on you, Sir Medicines, too. I fain would ask a hoist of you, uh, me corn's mm-hmm. hurt. Oh, certainly, but we were planning to sit here a while. Oh, fine. I'm not in a hurry. Oh. Well, do you mind riding in the back seat? Uh, a lift I shall scorn not, be it ever so humble. A front seat, a back seat, or even a rumble. <laughs> That's poetry. Oh, oh. a poet. Uh, <laughs> perhaps you've heard of me. Kitty Grew Shaw. No, can't say that. Uh, I was afraid not. Few people have. Where to, Mr. Shaw? Uh, my home, if you don't mind. It's it's somewhere around here, but I'm not quite sure where. I, I'm not very practical, you know, but I think a couple of turns to the right would find it. <laughs> Very kind of you to ask us in, Mr. Shaw. Yes, the sandwiches were lovely, but we really can't stay. My house is yours, tas yours, tas yours. Uh, do you happen to know what tas yours means? I use it a lot, and never knew what it meant. You know, it's a great honor to entertain you. With, uh, uh, what are the names? Oh, uh, Berry, Berry, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Tricky Berry. Well, uh, hey, Mr. Well, and Mrs. A, well, that will fix the blanket situation fine. Now, I have an extra sleeping porch and a bedroom in there. Of course, the bedroom's just been painted. You can take your choice. Oh, no, but wait. No, I don't think We've we... We've got to, Jerry. What else could we do? Where could we go? Well, uh, thanks. Fine. Well, good night. Good night. Parting is such sweet sorrow that I must say good night until tomorrow. Shakespeare. He stole it. Uh, good night. See you in the morning. Well, Gerald... I'll flip you for the sleeping porch. Oh, never mind. How dare you say you were married to me? Why, what would... What would... What would Grandma say? Oh, I knew it. Good night. You may find the paint pretty fresh, but you'll probably have a solution for that, too. Good night. Don't slam any doors on me. Hey. Hey, what did you do? I locked you in. That's what I did. Didn't Grandma always lock you in? How dare I say I'm married to you indeed? Who wants you? Mona. Who'd have you? Mona, I'm They ought to give you back to the Indians. Mona. Mona. You have no sense of humor at all. You can't even take a joke. And that's what it would be like, married to you, a joke. Mona, I can't breathe in here. I can't breathe. Jerry. Jerry.
Jerry! Jerry, what's the matter? Jerry, speak to me. Oh, what have I done? Say something, Jerry. Oh, yes. <clears throat> yes, I'm all right now, I think. Couldn't breathe. I didn't hear the paint. Oh. Oh, darling, I'm so sorry. Please tell me it's all right, Jerry. It's all right, darling. Oh, my darling. Alicia. Alicia? Why, you... Good night. Oh. Identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. We've completed the second act of The Perfect Specimen. And right after this short intermission, Errol Flynn, Joan Blondell, and Mae Robson will be heard in Act Three. In just a minute, our producer, Mr. DeMille, will bring you our special guest of the evening. Meanwhile, here's a tip for those clever women who know that clear, lovely skin wins and holds romance. Nine out of ten glamorous Hollywood stars use Lux Toilet Soap as their complexion care. This mild white soap has active lather that removes dirt, dust, and stale cosmetics thoroughly and leaves your complexion fresh and lovely. Use Lux Toilet Soap regularly. Before you renew makeup, always before you go to bed. Now, Mr. DeMille. In a world where perfection is rare, a person as super superlative as the Gerald Wicks of our play deserves a little investigation. So we've called in Dr. Floyd L. Rue, Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Southern California. In his field, Professor Rue is somewhat of a perfect specimen himself. During 1938, his book, Psychology and Life, was the best-selling volume of its kind in the world. Thanks, Mr. DeMille. But before you scare your listeners into thinking that I have a three-foot beard and use words even longer than that, please let me say that I don't read palms, feel bumps on the head, or attempt to cure fallen arches. <laughs> Having read your book, I can say that psychology is simply a science which attempts to understand the feelings of people and the reasons why they do things. Yes, that's about it. Now, take Gerald Wicks, for example. As a perfect specimen, is Gerald a trifle balmy, Professor? No, Gerald's just suffering from too much discipline. He's had an overdose of grandma. He's been bossed too much. Well, what's wrong with discipline? Too much bossing can make any man lose all hope. He'll swallow his pride until someday it boils over in an act of violence. The jails are full of such cases. Or he might easily seek to stimulate his wilted ego by reviving it in alcohol. Or he might do something as harmless as becoming a jitterbug to forget his disappointment in sensations of sound and rhythm. Anyway, let's not worry too much about Gerald. Perhaps love may point the way whether Grandma likes it or not. In any case, Act Three will tell us. Uh -huh. Do you think love is a solution for all human unhappiness? Not for all, but the right kind of love can go a long way to help. By the right kind, I mean the enduring kind of affection that involves cooperation between life partners and the surrender of certain selfish habits. The Casanova type of lover, who hurries from one girlfriend to the next, is trying to escape unhappiness in love, just as the drunkard attempts to escape it in alcohol. Neither method works. True love teaches us to sacrifice and to consider the feelings of others. It gives us no time for self-pity. And self-pity comes close to being the greatest single cause of human unhappiness. Well, are there any qualities in a man, Professor, that will never come to the surface unless he's lucky enough to find exactly the right wife? Uh, let me answer that by saying that there's no woman capable of turning her husband's stupidity into genius. But she can certainly help him to keep from showing it. She can, for example, make the timid soul feel important. His job may be menial, but if he's appreciated at home, he'll feel that life's worthwhile and that he has something to work for. Sometimes an otherwise meek husband becomes a regular bully at home, roaring at his wife if the soup's cold and jumping on the children if they holler for the funny paper. On the other hand, a clever woman can show a conceited man the way off his high horse without his even knowing it. 
she can teach the spendthrift the pleasures of saving and the selfish man the joys of giving. Mm, you, uh, you seem to know all about happiness and marriage. Don't you psychologists ever quarrel with your wives? We're human beings first and psychologists after. The answer's a humble yes. <laughs> so what do you do in a case like that? We go to see a psychologist. Goodbye, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> your, your head man, Professor. <laughs> the Perfect Specimen, starring Errol Flynn as Gerald and Joan Blundell as Mona, with Mae Robeson as Grandmother Wick. It's the following morning. In Killigrew Shaw's kitchen, the poet and Mona are seated at the table eating a hearty breakfast. Gerald, with an apron tied around his waist, is at the stove frying flapjacks. The flapjacks are pretty good. Where'd you learn to cook? Well, you see, most of the big industrial plants today have their own cafeterias for the employees, and it's a duty of the employers to make sure the food is wholesome and well-cooked. So is the prospective head of... Oh, yes. Oh, if I were the bride of a man who could cook, I'd do not but sit back in a nook with a book. <laughs> oh, I say that's pretty fair, isn't it? <laughs> yes, very Yes, good. your corns are certainly better this morning. Yes. Uh, too bad you folks can't stay. I'd be glad to engage you, Mr. Berry. A uh, hundred a month and board, nothing to do but cook. Oh, it's very kind of... Oh, no, but there is something you could do for me, though. Oh, it's already granted. What is it? Well, I, we're rather short of funds. Do you think you'd cash a small check for me, say $50? Oh, delighted. I, I like to cash checks for my friends, though they are seldom any good. I'll get the money while you make out the check. Faith in my friends, I'd quickly renounce if ever their checks refused to bounce. I'll always remember that Killigrew Shaw. Splendid chap, don't you think? Boom, boom, boom. Don't you think so? What? Hey, cat got your tongue? What's the matter? Nothing. Well, the rain's coming in. You better put down your window. Cold? Nope. Wet? Mm-hmm. Soaking. It's been raining for hours. What's the matter with you, Mona? You started out fine, but you've been getting grumpier and grumpier. I'm not grumpy, I'm thinking. What about? Windmills, mostly. The kind you can't lick. Who can't lick? I can lick them all. I can't. This one's a female windmill. And I didn't know about it till, till last night. Uh, by the way, I hate to be fussy, but I'd like to dry off. All oh, right. Well, we can stop right here in this town. You've got to get out of those wet clothes quick. Don't you think the townspeople might object? I mean, stop in a hotel, of course. I'll get your room. Got any luggage? Huh? Now, you see, we only want a couple of rooms for a couple of hours until the storm lets up. Well, uh, I guess it's all right then. Never let it be said that Poppinville was unkind out of town folks. Uh, will you sign right here? Uh, if you'll excuse me, I'll arrange for a suite. Sign? Yeah, you have to. Didn't you know that? Well, Grattan always did the signing for Grandma and me. Oh, I... Well, don't sign your right name. No, of course I won't, Mr. G. B. Berry. Well, what about me? I can't sign my right, right name either. I mean, this as much as you are, even more. Well, I'll put you down as my wife. I never had a wife, so even if they find out it's me, they never know who you are, will they? I wouldn't want anyone to know I was your wife. Who wants to be your wife? What's the matter? Nothing, you big dope. Who is it? Me. Come in. Hello. Listening for radio reports? Mm, yeah. And I'm thinking about what Tilly Specknagel got me into this time. Huh. Well, my clothes are all dried out. I'm all set to start again. If only the rain will let up. Oh, I say. You look very attractive. <laughs> Wrapped up in this old blanket, toasting my toes in the cinders. I'm an Indian. <laughs> You're a darling. Look out, Jerry. You're weakening. Oh, no, Mona. Don't make fun of me. I mean it. Yesterday and today with you, I... Well, I never knew before how marvelous life could be. And people on the outside could be. It's been... Well, it's been thrilling. I've hated to think of it ending. Mona. Mona, do you suppose we could... I mean... I think you... we'd better start. No, no, listen to me. We'd better. Mona, darling, I'm in love with you. I suppose I have been ever since that time you came crashing through our fence. Two days ago. Who was it? Yes. Well, I don't care if it was five minutes ago. I'm in love with you for keeps. And you, Mona, do you care? Care. Oh, dear, darling Jerry. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this program has been interrupted at the request of the Bureau of Investigation of the Department of Justice, which is now engaged in a relentless search for the kidnappers of Gerald Beresford Wicks. The last person to see the missing heir was his fiancée, Miss Alicia Brackett. Stand by for further announcements on the Wicks kidnapping. Well, that's that. Now, if you let me get dressed, you can go home to Alicia. But, Mona, I'm in love with you. You're engaged to her, aren't you? Yes, but I... And last night, when you were half-conscious, you called her name. I did? Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Oh. Oh, so that was the windmill you said you couldn't yes. make. I'd forgotten about her for the moment, but... But, Gerald, I really meant what I said about... about caring. Uh, but... But what? Oh, nothing. I guess just... just but. Go on, Gerald. I'll be dressed in a little while and we can leave. Remember, they're hunting for you, and me too. Well, let them hunt. But, Alicia... Oh, shut up. Now, you get dressed, and I'll be back in ten minutes, and you'll be ready. Whoa, Mona. Mona. Oh, I don't think I'm going to marry you. You will take too long to dress. Hey, Mona, it stopped raining. We'd better get along. Mona. Mona, hurry up. Cook. Good evening, Mr. Uh... Cook. Did you see my, my wife? Yep. She went out of here like a shot out of a gun. She was crying, too. She was crying? Yep. Too bad, mister. <laughs> Good morning, Professor Carter. Good morning. You can dump it, uh, let me see, uh, dump it behind the garage. The what? What's that? Aren't you the young man with the fertilizer? Oh, no, no, no. I'm looking for your daughter, Mona. Who? Oh, oh, yes, 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 of course. My daughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, she's not in. She's, uh, gone to Europe. Europe? Or was it Europe? No, I'm thinking of the time she came back from Europe. She's gone to visit, uh, uh, some friends. Uh, that's it, friends. Well, where are these friends, sir? I really don't know. But she'll be back in uh, two or three weeks, I think. Won't you come in and uh, wait? Oh, well. Uh, no, thanks. I'd better be going along, I think. And the net is being drawn closer in the nationwide hunt for the missing heir. The search for Gerald Wicks being conducted by the police and Mrs. Leona Wicks, the heir's grandmother, is at last beginning to bear fruit. After almost three weeks, several witnesses and suspects have been rounded up by Mrs. Leona Wicks and their alibis being carefully checked by the police and Mrs. Leona Wicks. An early hour solution to the mystery is promised by the police and Mrs. Leona Wicks. Hello? Hello. Uh, just a moment, please. Hello. Hello. Oh, phones, phones, phones. They're always ringing and nothing ever happens. Hello. What? Oh, my, my, you don't say. Why, isn't that interesting? Oh, yes, come by all means. Goodbye. Who was it? A Pennsylvania hotel clerk with a mysterious story. He's coming here. He says that somebody registered there as man and wife. And then he said something about, about the Pennsylvania state law. Another crack. I don't know why I tolerate such stupid people around me. Hello? What's that? The bank of... Yes. Yes, go on. Go on. Oh, my goodness. Well, now what is it? Oh, it's the state police. Oh. A Pennsylvania bank, bank received a check made out by Gerald for $50 the day after he disappeared. It was endorsed by one of the kidnappers named Killy Grew Shaw. They're holding him for instructions. Instructions? What do they want instructions for? Have him flown here at once. Someone had to pick the cotton Jink, you're the most stubborn, unreasonable Alicia, are you still here? Oh, please help me, darling Do you or do you not know where Gerald is? Oh, wait a minute Did you say darling? Yes That's different I might have an idea where to find him Then please tell me If I do I'm asking this for the last time, I hope. Will you marry me? 
We can set up housekeeping mighty pretty with that $25,000 reward, honey. All right, Jake. But we've got to find Gerald. Where is he? Well, uh, I don't know. Jake. But a girl once crashed through a fence. Jake, will you please? And I know where she lives. Now listen. In a little Pennsylvania town. Oh, stop. And if my hunch is right, then he's there too. Come on, Alicia. Jake, will you please? There's a gas station up there. What gas station? The one Dad said he was working at. Who was working at? Shh. Keep down low and hide your face. Good morning. Morning. My car's on the fritz. Think you could fix it? <laughs> sure. I'm master mechanic. So is your grandma Wicks. What's that? There he is, Alicia. Stick your head up. Gerald. Oh, no. Here, no, come no, back don't... here, you. What's the matter with you, Gerald? Oh, Alicia. I'm so sorry. But when I saw you just now, I... What? Well, it wasn't you. It was bars. Wicks there. Don't. Master, I just couldn't face it, that's all. You won't have to, Gerald. But you've got to come home. And uh, don't worry about Alicia. She's going to marry me. She's got... Alicia? You are? Why, that's marvelous. And just what do you mean by that? Well, it's my... Well, you know. I know. It's the old Carter charm. You see, Alicia, I've got a fence-smashing sister named Mona. Is this man mad? What's he talking about? Now, please, Mrs. Wicks, I'll try to speak to him. Now... You say you cashed a check for Mr. Gerald Wicks? For Gerald Wicks, I cashed a check. Oh, bad rhyme. <laughs> now listen here, Mr. Shaw. Where's my grandson? I don't know, but I'd like to see him again. He made marvelous flapjacks. Miss Mona Carter to see Mrs. Wicks. Carter, I knew it. I knew it. Show her in. Yes, sir. You knew what, you idiot? Show who it. I knew I'd remember it someday. Mona Carter. That's the name of the young lady who assaulted our fence. Good morning. How dare you run off with my grandson? Where is he? What have you done with him? If you quit yelling, I'll tell you what I know. Alfred, the girl's impudent. Young lady, you're impudent. I'm not. I came here voluntarily to tell you that Mr. Shaw had nothing to do with Gerald's going away. He was not kidnapped. All he wanted to do was get away from this penitentiary for a oh. while. And don't try to bully me like you did him. I won't stand for it. Why, you, 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 adventurous, you fortune hunter. You enticed him away. Oh, no, I didn't. I simply told him he was a fool to let himself be shut up here by a selfish, domineering old woman. Oh, and it uh, worked. How dare you? Yes, and how it oh. worked. Oh, if you'd only seen your precious Gerald slap down truck drivers, knock out prize fighters, uh, go flapjacks. My grandson. Your grandson. Well, where's he now? Well, I don't know. I haven't seen him for three weeks. Don't you lie to me, girl. You've hidden him away somewhere where you can practice your wiles on him. Don't talk to me like that. I wouldn't marry him if you paid me to. Oh, you wouldn't, huh? Am I not, miss? Because you're his grandmother. Oh, just a minute. Mr. Wicks. Did I hear you say you wouldn't marry me? And I meant it. It's Mr. Wicks. Oh, good. Gerald. Gerald, where have you been? Hello, Grandma. And why are you wearing those awful clothes? I'm a $30 a week garage man, Grandma. How do you like the improvement? Improvement? Don't flatter yourself. You look the same silly idiot you've always been and always will be. Oh, but Grandma... Gerald Wicks, if you think... Windmill, Jerry. Quiet. Now, the first thing you can get through your head is, Mona Carter, you're marrying me. I am not. What about Alicia? Alicia's marrying your brother Jink on the reward money. What? Yes, and you're marrying me, understand? Not if you were the last man in the world in the first place. I can't stand your family, especially this old tyrant. Oh, who's the tyrant? You are. Oh. You calling me a fortune hunter. I wouldn't marry that pet lamb of yours if he had $50 million. Oh. I, I suppose he isn't good uh, enough well, for you. Well, you suppose right. Of all the colossal brass. Now, let me tell you, young woman, you're marrying Gerald. And that's that. Grattan, bring me that envelope. Yes, Mrs. Wicks. Quiet. Sit down, Grattan. Oh. Quiet. Oh. Listen, Grandma, I'm choosing my wife, not you. That's what you think. This girl's got a will of her own. I like her. She's no milk and water, shally, dally, flip flop, weather vane like Alicia. Here it is, Mrs. Weeks. Now, here it is. You see that? What? what? Well, I, the, the hotel register. That's where you registered yourself and this sassy... Uh, Mona's my name. My name's Mona as man and wife. And here, here is a copy of a Pennsylvania law passed in 1827 and never appealed or amended. You want to hear it? Jerry, well, maybe we better. All right. all right. If a man or woman do jointly and before competent witnesses publish and acknowledge themselves to be man and wife, and in addition, if one or both do by written record under whatever name attest this status, this shall not... <gasps> does constitute a legal article of wedlock, and so may be registered and recorded. Oh, there, young lady. You try and get out of that. Well, what are you standing there for, General? Go on, kiss the bride. Go on, go on. Oh, Mona. Hey. Hey, what was that for? For taking orders again from her. Hey, Mona, where are you going? Come back here. 
So, you slap me. Go away. I'll slap you again. This is a fine way to start our married life. We're not married? Oh, yes, we are. I'll According to a Pennsylvania no. law. On what knows. grounds? I'll get a divorce. But you don't love me? Mm, no. Then you do, don't you? Well, you needn't be so brutal about it. Yes, I do. Well, that's all I wanted to know. You still want a divorce, darling? Well, as an old-fashioned girl, I don't believe in him. Oh, but Jerry... What? I was so frightened. Of what? Grandma? I should say not. I was frightened that you never would find out about that old Pennsylvania law. ended the play. And now let's talk to Errol Flynn and Joan Blondell, who made the perfect specimen perfect. Miss Blondell, incident, incidentally, belongs to perhaps the oldest family of actors in the world. Did you know that, Errol? Yes, I've heard that, sir. And then wasn't there an Eric Blondell who once belonged to a theatrical group called the King James Players? That was back in 1603. Eric was a clown and got fired from the company regularly. But he had a friend who always managed to get his job back again. This friend also made quite a reputation for himself. His name was William Shakespeare. Hmm, yeah, I, I seem to recall the name. <laughs> what part of Texas was he from? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, Joan, who was the first Blondell to clown for American audiences? Probably old Uncle George. I have a copy of a program dated 1783, telling about a party George Washington gave... No... Gave at Francis Tavern in New York, enlisting George Blondell as one of the entertainers. And the women didn't do so badly either. One of the Blondell girls has been on the stage for almost every generation for 300 years. Now, of course, Mr. DeMille, they didn't all use Lux soap. That's one of the good things that didn't come along until my time. But I'm one of your biggest boosters. I've always used it for the simple reason that I think Lux soap is the best complexion care there is. Well, that, that's one of the nicest compliments of the season, Joan, from one of the screen's most charming athletes. And here's one for you, Mr. Flynn. I've just seen Dawn Patrol, and my congratulations to you and Jack Warner for making it one of the finest aviation pictures ever filmed. Thank you, sir. It was a grand show to make, and I think everyone in it enjoyed it. Now that it's completed, you'll be sailing for Hawaii, won't you, Errol? Oh, not yet. That's in the summer. Uh -huh. Early in the spring, uh, there's some things called giant tuna, which hold a sort of jamboree down around Cat Cay in the Bahamas. Joan, they're the biggest tuna you ever saw. Five and six hundred pounds. Sometimes oh, they go out of... Yes, I know. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, if that's the way you feel about it, all right. I was going to bring you back a tuna fish sandwich, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. DeMille, and good night. Make mine on rye, Skipper. Good night, <laughs> Mr. DeMille. Good night, Joan. Good fishing, Harold. A dramatic event of unusual importance comes to this theater next Monday night. And in a moment, Mr. DeMille tells you all about it. The original story, The Perfect Specimen, was written by Samuel Hopkins Adams. And in its cast tonight, you heard Byron K. Folger as Alfred Grattan, Lindsay McCary as Killigrew Shaw, Alma Lloyd as Alicia, Clem Bevins as Professor Carter, Eddie Waller as Sheriff Snodgrass, Ross Forrester as Pinky, Gay Seabrook, as Clarabelle, Billy Bletcher as Conley, Frank Nelson as Jink Carter, Lou Fulton as Hooker, Earl Ross as Hotel Clerk, Lou Merrill as Announcer, Bob Burleson as Referee, and Edward Marr as Butler. May Robeson's new Warner Brothers picture is They Made Me a Criminal. Louis Silvers appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studios, where he was in charge of music for the new film, Kentucky. Here's Mr. DeMille. Every once in a while, a play comes to the screen which is lifted by sheer brilliance and dramatic power out of the field of entertainment and becomes an unforgettable memory. Such a play we've prepared for next Monday night, Myling, the story of a love greater than a kingdom, a devotion that triumphed even over death. I'm happy to announce that Myling brings back to this stage two superb artists. In the role of Prince Rudolph, you'll hear... William Powell. And as Marie, the girl for whom he lost his heart and throne, 
Miss Janet Gaynor. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents William Powell and Janet Gaynor in Myerling. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Tonight's presentation, ladies and gentlemen, came to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, the complexion care preferred by nine out of ten of the lovely Hollywood screen stars. This is your announcer, Melville Roy, bidding you all good night and wishing...